Good evening and welcome once again to Word and Sword TV broadcast coming to you live from the WHKY studios in Hickory, North Carolina. And we're just thrilled to death that you've chosen to tune in tonight. We thank you so much for that. Well, we're honored by it. Uh, there are a number of places you could be tuned into right now. And if you're here, we thank you so much for that. We're going to be continuing our study of what the Bible says about how people were converted in the, in the New Testament. And if you will, get your Bibles out and be ready to start with us in just a few minutes as we do consider these things from God's Word. If you've been watching the program very long or if you've been just tuned in, we want to make you aware that you need your Bible. Uh, don't just take what I say or what any man says. Make sure that what a person says is from the Bible. And you, you uh, take your Bible out and check anyone that's on TV and make sure and ch check your own preachers out. Check everybody out. Because people can be wrong. Every person is fallible. Every person can be in error. Um, I can, you can, all of us can. And the only way we know whether the truth is being taught is to check it by the truth and to be sure that uh, the Bible is being uh, lifted up and that men's words are not being accepted as gospel. That's the reason we have such division in the religious world. And that is a tragedy because Jesus didn't want it in John 17. He prayed that we all might be one, as the Father was in Him and He was in the Father, that all might be one in Him. And so the world might believe that He has sent them. Now you think about that and you look at the religious division today and what's going on in the political world right now, it pales in comparison to what has been going on in the religious world for many, many, many years. Now, the latest statistic I heard is there are 38,000 different denominations out there now. And that is growing by two to three a day, a day. Now that's alarming. Can there be 38,000 ways to go to heaven? Can there be two ways to go to heaven? Nope. There's only one way to go to heaven and that's through the Lord and through what He has told us to do in His Word. We have to follow His steps. And when we follow the steps of the Master, we're going to end up where the Master is. He is in heaven now, reigning at the right hand of the throne of God. And uh, again, we will all be judged one day, and He will redeem the church back to Himself, uh, bring it back to Himself, and deliver it up to the Father. And He will, we will all be redeemed and be in heaven one day. But right now, we are supposed to be members of His one church. Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus said upon this rock, the confession that He was the Christ, the Son of God that Peter had made, that He would build His church. And the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. And He would give to him the keys of the kingdom. And we know that Peter was the first one that was delivered the gospel to, the recorded gospel to the Jews and also delivered the recorded gospel to the Gentiles. And so uh, open the door to salvation to all mankind with the gospel. It was not Peter that saved anybody. It was not any apostle that saved anybody. It was Christ. And the same is true today. And it is the gospel that reveals to us how we are to be saved. You remember that Paul, Saul of Tarsus we talked about last week, last program, that he was, a, he was an individual who was told to go into the city and it would be told him what he must do. So the words of the Lord are very important. What God says is very important. And what God commands a man to do is very important that we do it, isn't it? We just can't ignore what God said to us. So. We want, we're going to be talking tonight about conversions and what it means to be converted as we go through our study tonight. Turn to the book of Acts and we'll get started in just a moment. But before that, we want to thank you once again for tuning in tonight. We want you to be aware of a gospel meeting that's going on at the State Line Church of Christ. There will be a meeting that will be going on with the Newton Church of Christ in November. State Line will have one this coming weekend, uh, starting Friday night at 7 o'clock, and Saturday night at 7, and then Sunday at the regular times. So if you're in those areas down around Charlotte, you make sure that you do that, and Newton will have their meeting, I believe, starting November the 4th, or in that area. 
And so uh, keep keep that in your mind. Ron Halbrook will be doing the speaking in that one, and I'm, I'm not really sure about who the state line preacher is. But uh, keep that in mind, if you will, and uh, avail yourself of every opportunity you can to go and hear God's Word preach wherever it may be. We want you to know that our call operators are standing by. This is a live show, and uh, if you want to come on the air live with a Bible question, our screeners will, will uh, talk with you. And if you want to come on the air, they will decide uh, whether we, we can do that or not. But uh, maybe you want to, to just write a, write a uh, question down or give them a question, and they'll get it to me, and I'll deal with it throughout the program if you want to do it that way. Some people just shy about coming on TV, and we understand that. But the operators are standing by, and you can call and, uh, with a Bible question, or you can call and ask for a copy of the, of the presentation tonight or previous lessons. You can also ask for a free Bible correspondence course. We have two of them, and uh, one of them is online, and you can go to the website, www.wordandsword.com, and you can get that, uh, that, that one online, and actually you can take it as an interactive uh, presentation. Um, we want to hope that all of you who are in the uh, Bryan Center over in Lincoln are listening to the program and watching the program tonight. Uh, about 10 or 12 of you are, are tuning in and we appreciate that and we want to thank you for doing that. We thank you so much for doing that. We have some who are in the jails up in the Polkton area who are tuning in and we are glad that that's happening too and thank you for that. And again, don't feel free to ask any questions that you have. Call the program. The number is 828-485-5555. You can call and ask to be added to the, Beacon's mailing, the Beacon mailing list, which is the, <clears throat> the, week, the monthly publication of the Newton Church of Christ. And all of this is, is free of charge, by the way. No charge for any of the materials that we send you from here. Uh, you can get free Bible study aids at www.wordandsword.com. You can call in tonight again with a biblical question or comment and receive a book, chapter, and verse answer. And if we are not able to provide one sufficiently for you that satisfies you, you let us know and we will send you a sermon on that subject that you have a question about. You can also like us on Facebook by going to www.facebook.com slash wordandsword. And you can post a question there if you would like. You can go to www.facebook.com slash Newton North Carolina Church of Christ and note the difference in the cases on that, if you will. And uh, in e either of those on Facebook, you can leave a question and we will be glad to have a discussion with you there. And you can follow us also on Twitter and post a, a question there if you would like at Word and Sword. Twitter at Word and Sword. And again, we thank you so much for your time tonight, and we want you to call in tonight at 828-485-5555. That's 828-485-5555, and uh, leave your question that you have, or if you would like to come on the air, talk with one of our operators. We do ask that you leave us information that we can uh, verify when you do call in, we do have to screen because we are a live program and we want to be sure that nothing gets through that is not decent. And uh, we don't expect anybody to be indecent, but sometimes that does happen from time to time in live programming. And so we want you to, uh, to know that that's the purpose of our screening and we have been instructed to do that by the station. And so the station has to be very careful with that and we respect that and we honor that and we try to cooperate in every way we can to do that. So if you will, call and be, be courteous, and we will do our best to be courteous back to you. We don't want to argue with you. We don't want you to argue with us, but we do uh, expect if a person believes something to press your point, and we can do that without getting angry or ugly. So if you will, 828-485-5555, and uh, we would be glad to entertain your questions. Most important question in the world that could ever be asked is what must I do to be saved? And we know that God is willing to save all mankind. He has given a plan whereby all men can be saved. He has, through His grace, bestowed salvation upon all if we are willing to accept it through obedience to His will. 
God is merciful, God is long-suffering, and God is loving, and He cares for us. And all of those are God's part in what He has done for us. He so loved us that He gave His Son. He spared nothing in what He gave for us. And in response to that, we must listen to what His Word says. Now there's two types of listening, as you recognize. There's a person who just listens politely and then goes on and doesn't pay any attention to what's been said. There's the casual listener, and then there is the studious listener. And that's what we must do when we're trying to find out what we must do. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we know that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So we have to hear what God's saying to us. It is clear He has given us His Word. Now if we don't ever avail ourselves of it, it's, his, it's our problem. In John 8 and verse 24, except you believe that He is, he is the Lord, you'll die in your sins. In Romans 10:10, 10, 10, we see faith come that, that uh, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Galatians 3:26 says, "We're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus." Hebrews 11:6, "Without faith, it's impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must believe He is." and that He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. So these are things the Bible says author, are authorized for salvation. Now notice, nowhere does the Bible say these things alone. So we have to compare all of what God has said and go on. And if you'll notice in all the instances that are mentioned, everything that is in this plan that God has given us is not mentioned in, in every passage. But that does not mean, and that does not preclude the concept that we don't, uh, we're not supposed to obey it. Now in Luke chapter 13 verse 3, uh, we know that we must repent. Acts 2 and verse 38, people were told to repent and be baptized. Acts 17, 30, times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So repentance is involves the changing of, of your lifestyle. In Matthew 10, 32, if we confess Christ before men, He'll confess us before His Father who's in heaven. In Acts 8, 27-39, the eunuch, upon hearing about Jesus Christ, said, I believe, uh, here's water, what keeps me from being baptized? And he was told by Philip, if you believe you can, he said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In Romans 10, verse 10, once again, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then in Mark 16, 16, we know he, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In Acts 2 and verse 38, we know that they were told to repent and be baptized. In Romans 6, 4 through 6, baptism is a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 27 says baptism is how we get into Christ. And we know in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 that baptism doth also now save us. Not the washing of the filth of the flesh, but the interrogation of a good conscience toward God. So think about that. Have you done all of these things like the Bible says? We're going to be talking a little bit tonight about baptism and what baptism must be for. And we'll talk about those in some of our cases of conversion. But after you've been baptized, that doesn't mean that you've got your ticket punched to heaven, because you must live faithfully. In Acts 10 and verse 47, the Lord will add you to His church, and you need to be faithful to the Lord's church, the local church, wherever it may be, in whatever location you need to function in that church faithfully. And you'll be a Christian, and you'll be told to serve God faithfully unto death, Revelation 2.10, and Matthew 24 and verse 13, faithful to the end. So we all must do that. We all must be obedient to what God has told us to do. And if you haven't done these things, and we can help or we can study further with you on these items, we would urge you to call and let us know, and we would be glad to study in your home with you. Now, we invite you to attend the assemblies at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. The regular assembly times are each Sunday at 9.30, and the worship times are at 11 o'clock. Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., and occasionally there are gospel meetings like the one they'll be having in November. So. Keep those things in mind, if you will, and assemble with the church at Newton. By the way, this program is sponsored <coughs> by the Newton Church of Christ. 
That meets at 656 St. James Church Road, and you can contact the church by going to email at contact at wordandsword.com or by phone at the building at 828-465-3009, or you can contact the Newton Church of Christ by going to mail at P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. That's P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. Feel free to contact the church at Newton and let them know uh, what your Bible question might be or if you need a ride to their services or whatever it might be, please call and let that be known or write and let that be known. Again, we ask that you do not send any money for anything that uh, we offer on this program. This uh, program is fully supported by the Newton Church of Christ and by the free will offerings that they give on the first day of the week as commanded in 1 Corinthians 16, 2 and also 2 Corinthians 9. And we do not solicit your money. We do not. We again, we repeat, we do not want your money. So do not send money. All right. Now someone says, am I on the right station? Yes, you are. Uh, the Newton, the, our, this program has never solicited money from viewers and we never will. So you just make sure that you uh, heed the words that are uh, presented here, check them out to be if they are from God. And if you find them to be so, then put them to practice in your life. That's all we ask. And that we present God's Word and sow the seed of the Kingdom in this area. Well, we ask you to turn to the book of Acts, and we have been studying conversions in the book of Acts. And we know that people need to receive the Word of God, as we talked about at the very beginning. Receiving the Word of God is absolutely essential. We cannot be saved without uh, heeding the Word of God. There are conversions tonight that we'll be talking about in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 17, if you'll turn there, verses 1 through 34. That's Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 34. Now the Apostle Paul uh, and Barnabas and Silas and others, John Mark and others, were involved in going on what was called missionary journeys, what we commonly refer to as that. And the, the outline of the book of Acts is in chapter 1 and verse 8, where Jesus said, You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. So the, the apostles were going to be going out and they were going to be teaching and the evangelists would be going out and doing that. And so the, the book of Acts is really a running history of how the church was established in the different regions and in the different areas of the world in the first century. We know that before the end of the first century, the gospel, uh, the, the Word of God was established and people, it had been preached through all the areas of the known world at that time. So we're going to be talking tonight about the church at Thessalonica, the church at Berea, the church at Athens, and the church at Ephesus and Corinth. So keep that in mind, if you will, as we go through Acts 17. In Psalm 19 and verse 7, Psalm 19 and verse 7, a very beautiful passage. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And the testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple. Now that word simple is not a word that is designed to, to upset anybody. It's just a, all of us are sometimes very simple when it comes to understanding God's Word. We can become wise by looking to His Word and to His law. It makes us wise. It brings us out of the simplicity of this world and the thinking of this world, the simple-mindedness of this world, and makes us wise unto salvation. So as we look at uh, chapters 2 through 16 of the book of Acts, we find the Jews, we've already studied these things. The Jews on Pentecost heard, they were pricked in their hearts, they repented, and they were baptized. That's Acts 2 verses 14 through 42. And the Lord added them to the church daily, those who were being saved, verse 47. The Samaritans in Acts 8 heard Jesus preached. They believed and they were baptized. The eunuch in Acts 8, verses 30 through 39, heard, believed, and was baptized. The Gentiles in Acts 10, 1 through chapter 11, 18, 
heard, believed, and were baptized. Lydia and her household in Acts 16, 11 through 15, heard, believed, and heeded, and then they were baptized. And then we also know the jailer in Acts 16, 25 through 34, heard, he believed, he was baptized. And that's Acts 8, 16. Now, as you see the chart here, this is the area of the, of the world. These are the regions on the right-hand side of Asia Minor. And we see the Roman Empire uh, pretty much here in this region in the Mediterranean area, the Aegean. And uh, the church was established in these areas. Uh, and and we, see, we see these journeys in Acts 17, 1. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now you remember the, the uh, Gentiles had wanted, uh, there were those that had wanted the gospel to be preached at one time in the Gentile world, but Paul was prohibited from going there at that time. But now he is over in the Gentile world now preaching the gospel. Now the journey from Philippi to Thessalonica was about 100 miles from Amphipolis and Apollonia, approximately 30 mile intervals on the Ignatian Way. Now the Ignatian Way, if you, if you know anything about your history or if you've studied that area in your ancient history, Greek history, the Ignatian Way and the Roman history that is there, the Ignatian Way was a very common trade route. It was a route that was used by all people and it, so it would only follow that that highway would be an area where you would want to put churches and to establish churches because a lot of people would be coming through there in trade routes and things such as that. And you would be able to teach them and they'd be able to go on their way. It's interesting that Thessalonica, Ephesus, Corinth, and, and Rome later on, and Jerusalem were all places where the gospel was presented. And as you look at the, where they're located on the, on the uh, map here, we see that all of them were areas, as you look at this map, they are all areas that are basically coastal except for Jerusalem. So looking at those areas and seeing Athens, Greece, and Corinth, and uh, Berea, and Apollonia, and Philippi, and Pergamum, and Thyatira, look at how many of them are on the seacoast. Now if you have a topographical map, you will see that it's not very far from the seacoast to the mountains. And the mountains rise up very quickly in the Mediterranean from the coastal areas. And so on those trade routes, there was one route that ran from Asia Minor, it's called the China Road, and it goes all the way through the Taurus Mountains, and it was the main trade route over to China. So again, that's another area where we, when we talk about the wisdom of God and the presenting of the Word of God, and as you follow your Bible study, and follow these different places that are mentioned, you see that in the book of Acts we're first introduced to them and then later on we have letters that were written to many of these churches. So as we're studying our Bibles, let's not uh, just, just read the book of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, let's read about the establishment of that church and how hard it was for them. Now Amphipolis is in, is in an area as, there, as you're passing through Amphipolis, you're not far from where the 300, the Battle of the 300 was taking place. And if you, most people know that about, about ancient history. Uh, the Spartans uh, held off the Assyrian army for many, many, uh, for quite a while. Uh, just enough time to give the Greeks uh, room to, to gather together and to march against the forces and to win against them. So again, that's, uh, these are historical areas and what we find as we study the Bible and see these places mentioned, these are real places with real histories. They're not made up fairy tales. This is not God writing a, an imaginary fiction book. These are real events with real people in real places. And they took place and we see that uh, these are things that happened, really happened. They, they weren't imagined. And they're not good stories we tell. This is, the, this is how it was done in the first century. It's the history of the New Testament church. Notice that it's the history of the church. It's not the history of any denomination. It's the history of the Lord's church. 
And when you find people doing what they did in the first century in all these different places, you will find people acting with the authority of God, just like all of these places were. Somebody says, you mean the church, the rules for the church have not changed in over 2,000 years? Yes, that's what we mean. That God's rules for His church and how it's to be led and what its work is and how we are to function in it and what type of situations we are to take place in, in the body of Christ, all of that is the same as it was over 2,000 years ago when it was established in Jerusalem in 33 A.D. And so as we're studying, let's look and see what they were doing, and we'll see what we are supposed to be doing as we go through. Thessalonica is a large, important town of Macedonia. It was visited by Paul on several occasions, and it was the seat of a church to which two letters were addressed, First and Second Thessalonians. Now there, during the first three centuries of the, uh, of, after the death of Christ, Thessalonica was the capital of the whole country between the Adriatic and the Black Sea. So you can see that it was a very important town. Now after Alexander the Great's death, the Jews spread rapidly in all the large cities of the provinces, which, which had formed in his empire. So there was no doubt that in the first century there were settled in, uh, in Thessalonica considerable numbers of Jews. And that contributed to the establishment of Christianity there because Paul went in Acts 17 verse 1, as was his custom and his practice. He was not worshiping as a Jew, living under the new law. He was not bound to worship as a Jew. He went to the synagogues. That's where the Jews were. That's where he could reason with them. That's where he could teach. He also taught in the school of Tyrannus and other situations over in Ephesus. But he availed himself of going to places where people were gathered, and he availed himself of those opportunities to teach the Word of God. Now on a side note, what we find here is that Paul was very evangelistic, and the Word of God is a told word. And we are to be people. And some people say, I, I want to witness for Jesus. Well folks, we can't witness for Jesus uh, because we didn't see the things that happened. We can't be eyewitnesses. And we would not be called in a court of law because we would have information that was not eyewitness information. But we see it through the eyes of faith and we believe it through the eyes of faith, and it is certain through the eyes of faith that all of these things took place. The witnesses, the testimony is impeccable, and the record is impeccable. People have been trying to destroy the Word of God for years, and they have none of them been successful. Christianity, once it was established at Thessalonica, spread into the various directions, and particularly around the, the districts where the merchants would be going in the city. Now there was a chief station on the great Roman road called the, the, the Ignatian Way, and that was north of the Aegean Sea. And in Acts 16 and verse 11, Paul was on this road at Neapolis, and Philippi, and his route later went, went through that place. And he brought two well-known uh, stations mentioned in, in his itinerary out and let us know exactly where he was traveling. So that tells us something. Again, real places, real situations, real roads, real events, real things that happened, not imaginary. So as we look at Thessalonica was an invaluable center for the spread of the gospel because of the, cent the, the, the location of it and its importance in the area. We might liken it very much today to our large cities in this country. Uh, what does a large city have going for it? Well, a lot of people come there from everywhere. It has a lot of trade going on in it. You have Chicago, you have New York, you have Los Angeles, you have just around the country there are a number of large cities. Now if, if we were going to be teaching the gospel today as they were in the New Testament, I would imagine that they, these places would be places that you and I would go. Somebody would say, well, that, th those are wicked places. Well, these places were wicked too. But it's a, they, are, they are prime locations for a lot of souls. And that's what we ought to be looking for. We ought not to be looking for someone that just fits our particular socioeconomic uh, standard. But we should be seeking and saving those who are lost searching and sowing the seed to those people. And again, 
the location of Thessalonica to the sea also was a prime place for it because of its location with the trade routes. Now, there was a, a seaport that was located at the head of the Gulf in Macedonia, the Maic Gulf, and the largest city of Macedonia was Thessalonica, had a population of over 200,000, and it was called the mother of all Macedon at one time. So once again, had great significance, a great significant city, and the church is going to be established there at Thessalonica. And this city also had been granted the status of a free city by Rome. Now a free city of Rome, Tarsus was one of those also, you got that status by either being friendly to the, to the Caesar, by uh, the founders of the city or by the people of the city actually uh, doing something great for the cause of the Romans, and that's how you got that status. So. Uh, Rome would bestow that upon you, and there were particular privileges that came with a citizen of a city that was a free city of Rome. They were allowed to govern themselves for the most part, and that says a great deal. So Thessalonica would have a freer area. There would be a more free reign and teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in a city that was a free city. So in 1 Thessalonians, however, verse chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul relates here about this, these brethren, he says, you were once very immoral, as is the case with many large cities. Not only is it a Mecca for a great deal of trade and a lot of possibilities for the sowing of the seed of the Word of God, but also it's a place where those who are not what they should be, for them to make merchandise of other people, all the, low, the lowly people of all types of castes of society, would find a home in those areas. And as we see that there's, it's a tremendous potential to save souls, it's also a tremendous potential for Satan to destroy souls. And so Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned from God, or, or, to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now we look at this, and, and so this was a very idolatrous city. It was an immoral city. Now sometimes we say, well, why would it be immoral and idolatrous? Did idol worship involve immorality? Yes, it did. So sometimes when you refer to an immoral city, you're also referring to an idolatrous city because they went hand in hand. As you go back and study the history of the God worship that took place during this time, you see that there's a lot of Greek culture that were, was involved in that, and there's a lot of Greek legends and things such as that that were involved in all of this. And involved in, in worship to these gods was the committing of fornication. So Paul says to these people at Thessalonica, you once were idolatrous people. You didn't even worship God. Now let me ask you something. Let's just stop right here for a minute. Do you think that you could convert with God's, by using God's Word? Do you think that you could convert a person that doesn't even believe in God? The Word of God's that powerful. What is Paul using? Is there some magic potion? Is the Holy Spirit just slapping these people upside the head and saying, you get over? No, it's the words that are being spoken, that are being heeded, and the reasoning that's being done from the Scriptures that is bringing these people to understand they need to change. Friends, there was a great deal of difference between the God of the Bible and the gods the people served. The gods they served were people, were, were individuals much like they were. You see, what they had done to God, although they would worship what they called gods, what they had done is they had given God human attributes. Their gods were fallible. Their gods were weak. Their gods could make mistakes. But here we have a God that does not do any of those. He is absolutely right in all that He does. And then we see the story of Jesus had particular interest to them because in the worship of the gods there was an understanding of an afterlife but there was an understanding that perhaps you would not be able to participate in it. 
But now the gospel of Jesus Christ comes and says we'll all be resurrected one day. We will come forth from the grave and we'll all be better. We're not going to be gods, but we will be better off if we are serving the true God as we should. This is a God who has been vindicated among the heathens in the Old Testament and he's being vindicated here. We see that in the very turning from their own gods that they had fashioned with their hands, that they had built temples to with their own hands, made of stick and sticks and lumber and things such as that, and stones and things like that. They had built their, their, their temples to their gods. They had invented their own gods. And their philosophers had invented their gods. And so their gods were answerable to them. They weren't answerable to their gods. If you, they were very superstitious people, very much superstitious. Again, in Acts 17 and verse 1, this city of, of Thessalonica was not only an immoral city, it was had a large Jewish population with a synagogue, Acts 17 and verse 1. 1 Thessalonians was written about 52 AD from Corinth, and Paul sent, uh, it was sent to the brethren by Timothy, who was a very good man, and he returned with great news about how the Thessalonians were serving God with everything they had. And that's a wonderful story. Now Paul and Silas and Timothy went into the synagogue on the Sabbath in Acts 17 verses 1 and 2. They went, on, went to the synagogue and they were, what did they do there? Well, they did not violate God's Word. They did not go back to worshiping under the old law. Synagogue worship, by the way, was never mentioned under the old law. But it was the common way in which the Jews would get together and study the, the law. But Paul and Silas and Timothy go there on the Sabbath and they do this for three weeks. Now somebody says, well see there they're worshiping on the Sabbath day. They're not going there to, to worship on the Sabbath day. Sabbath day worship has been nailed to the cross. But on the Sabbath day, the Jews who still believe the law is in, is in force, they're meeting there on Sabbath. Now that's of no significance to Paul and Silas and Timothy. Once it was, but not now. And so what you see there is that's where everybody is, and that's where they go. Now, once again, let me ask you, would you walk into the assembly of the Seventh-day Adventists or some others who are Sabbath worshipers and say, I'd like to preach to you about Jesus Christ and about the law of Jesus Christ? Would you do that? That's what they would do. They would go right into the middle of them. Somebody says, well, that would be disrupting their religious service. No, it wasn't. They didn't go in there and start a fight. This was a place where it was common for religious ideas to be exchanged. Now you would think today that a church would be a place where you could have a, a reasonable and civil exchange of religious ideas in a Bible class format, or maybe perhaps even in a debate. If it's prearranged and orderly, because all things that are done with the Lord's people must be done decently and in order. But you'd think that'd be a place where people would be interested in knowing what the Bible says, wouldn't you? But you know, today we're afraid to talk about our differences, aren't we? In religious matters, we don't want to talk about our differences. We just want to go on with what we've all been told and what we've always believed, and we don't want anybody to rattle the cage or rock the boat. Well, Paul and Silas and Timothy would have been very unpopular. You have to look back and see if those people could even preach in churches today, even the Lord's Church, because these were bold men that had a bold message that changed the world and still does. And they weren't ashamed to talk about it. They weren't out to try to beat up, beat up everybody with it, but they were out to teach everybody they could find and every opportunity they could get. Notice in chapter 17 and verse 2, it says they reasoned with them from the Scriptures. They didn't go in and say, I'm going to perform a miracle and drop 25 of you dead right where you stand. They didn't do that. They brought the Word. They had miracles to sustain what they were saying, but the power was in the Word. The power was not in the miracle necessarily. The, word, the miracle ver merely verified 
that the words they were, they were speaking were true. Now, in, in chapter 17 and verse 3 of Acts chapter 17, it says they explained and proved that Jesus was the promised Messiah of the Old Testament, and that He had to suffer, that He had to die, and they had to, that He had to be raised from the dead, that that was essential. That was according to Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. So He reasoned with them from the Old Testament. Now, you think about this, this Jesus also He preached that died on the cross and was the Messiah, was named Emmanuel, which meant God in the flesh. So if you're a heathen listening to this, you're hearing that God died for man. And you think about that. You're a heathen, and your gods don't die for men. They kill men. But they don't have this type of compassion. They don't have this type of love and care. And they don't make promises that they never back out on. The gods of the world don't do that. And that was their understanding with the gods of the world. But now we have a God who is curious to them. He's a God of compassion. A God who is not willing for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. A God who loves, whose very name is love. God is love. His nature is love. But He is also just, innately just, impeccably just in all that He does, and everything He says is right. That's a different God from the gods they worshiped. Well, some were persuaded in chapter 17 and verse 4, this is the history of Thessalonica, and some joined them. They were persuaded and they joined them. Now, how, did you, how do you join up with the Lord's people? You don't have a vote. You don't present yourself up for membership and the church vote on you. How do you join the Lord's people? The Lord adds to the church daily who? Those who are being saved. So when we read in Acts 17 verse 4 that they were persuaded, what were they persuaded of? That Jesus was the Messiah, that He died, was buried, and arose, and that according to Isaiah 53 we deserve to? And as the people on Pentecost cried out and said, What shall we do? These brethren were persuaded to do the same. That's by inference, of course. But we look at this and we see that. Now we're going to talk in just a moment, because some may say, Well, you know, you're just, you're just putting things in there. Just wait just a minute. We're going to make a point. Well, let's look at this. Unbelieving and envious Jews formed a mob of, of uh, evil men and talk them in to attempting to stop the spread of the gospel. Again, Satan is working hard to sow tares everywhere the seed of the Word of God is. It disturbs Satan for people to be growing. It disturbs Satan for the gospel to be having its way in a community. And rest assured that Satan will do everything he can to, to sow tares among brethren, to sow tares among the world. He wants to destroy the truth. Everywhere it is sown, the seed is sown. He wants to take it up before it even has time to take root. And so he is intent on that. We need to be aware of that. And so there were always the unbelieving and envious Jews who followed Paul around anywhere he went and tried to undo everything he did. Well, is that going to happen today? Yes. There are skeptics among us. There are people that cannot be content with the mere sowing of the seed of the Word of God and the harvest that comes from that. They can't be content with that. We have self-promoters in Galatians chapter 1. Paul says in verse 6, I marvel, talking to people in the church, that you are so, far, so soon removed from him that called you unto another gospel, which is not another. But there are some who would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So. You see, there's always the perverters. There's always those who are strifeful, those who are willing to undo all the things that have been done for good. There are the people that will tear up, and there are the people who will build. And the Bible is very clear about that. that just happens. In the course of our sowing the seed and doing God's will, we are going to meet with resistance. That is what happens. It does happen. 
And we don't need to be surprised about that. But that doesn't cause us to stop spreading the word. It doesn't cause us to stop speaking and to stop doing our best to try to serve God. And every, every opportunity we have to serve God faithfully, we should do that. And we should undermine and, and speak out against every effort that is made to rend the body of Christ asunder. We ought to speak out about that. Well, some of these unbelieving and sordid men, as, as they're called, uh, low-life men that were, they, you, you know the kind, they can be bought, and they can be bought to kind of uh, stir up trouble anywhere they go, kind of like some of the groups that are out there today in the pol political world. They have a price, and they don't really have a cause, but they'll have a cause if you want them to. You just tell them what the cause is, and they'll stir people up. Well, they attacked the house of Jason, and he had welcomed Paul and his group into his house, Acts 17, verses 5 through 7, and he had them there, and they were enjoying studying God's Word, and then these men come to Jason's house, and all they're doing is studying God's Word, and they attack him. And the power of the gospel to turn the world upside down takes place, and notice what is said here in Acts 17, verse 6. Those that have turned the world upside down have come our way also. Boy, wouldn't it be a great thing to be accused of today, to be accused of turning the world upside down for Christ? Hmm. What a compliment. Here's the folks that are doing that. Well, folks, I'll tell you that the Newton Church of Christ and every Christian I know of and every part of the world that I know of that's faithful to the Lord is trying their best to turn the world upside down for Jesus. They're not shy about the teaching of God's Word. They don't back up. They don't apologize for it. They are doing their best to sow the seed of the Word of God in the hearts of men and to bring about the product that God brings in the increase of souls. The fields are whitened to harvest. And notice where they go. They go to places that maybe you and I might not go. Places that we have become, have become unpopular for us to go to because we tend to, to want to delineate who we teach and who we don't. Notice, brethren and friends tonight that are listening, that this is all about sowing the seed. It's not all about baptizing them. We see that that does happen. But it's all about getting the Word out there, isn't it? Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. He wants you to be saved and go live with Him. God doesn't want anybody to be lost. He's not slack concerning His promise. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants us all to humble ourselves before Him and be obedient to what He's told us to do. That's, what, that's a message that needs to get out. There's forgiveness of sins out there. There's hope. There's a way that you can pillow your head at night without guilt. There's a way you can do that. That's a message that needs to be told, doesn't it? There's answers to the questions of life that tear men apart, and they're found in this beautiful book we have, God's Word. And that's why one of the reasons this program is centered around God's Word. We're sowing the seed tonight. We are hoping that the result of that will be that this area will be stirred to not just go along with what somebody says, some man says, or what some religious denomination says, but that you will go back to the Bible and find out what God wants you to do, and that you will implement it in your life. These people, again, demean Paul. They thought if they destroyed the messenger, they would destroy the message. And so they go and accuse Paul of teaching things against Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Well, we know from other passages that Paul did not teach from the inspiration of the, of the Holy Spirit that he didn't teach against Caesar. We know that he taught in Romans, 4, Romans 13 that the powers that be are ordained of God and that we should be submissive to the laws and that we should pray for kings. This is Paul's stance on all of this. He didn't say to destroy the kings. He didn't say to undermine the politics. He just said, and this was a time, he lived during a time when Nero was the king. 
And he said, pray for that man. Wow. Isn't that great? Pray for him. Pray for leaders, not just him, but all the tetrarchs, all the different rulers in the cities and in the provinces and in the regions. Pray for them. Do you pray for the leaders today? Do you pray for them to use wisdom and not be selfish? Do you pray for that? Once again, did you know that some of the leaders in the first century were converted to Christ? Wouldn't that be great? Because you see, when you have a Christian involving, involved in the ruling of men, you know what happens? He leads them in a path that is from the Word of God. Because he is led by the Word of God. You see, folks, all of our problems if we, that we have today could be settled if all men everywhere would come to the cross, humble themselves, submit themselves to God's will, teach it and practice it in their lives, and expect others to do the same. You see, our problems aren't unsolvable. The solutions are there. We just don't implement them. And when we talk about reaching people for Christ and turning the world upside down, we see that that's been happening already through the book of Acts into the first 16 chapters, and now it will happen all the way to the end. The book of Acts is a victory song from the beginning to the end. The teaching of the Word of God comes forth victorious every time it's taught, folks. Somebody says, does that mean that people are going to be baptized every time? No. But it's a victory. Every time the Word of God is spoken, and it's truth in its simplicity. And that's true whether a person is speaking it who just obeyed the gospel, or whether someone is speaking it that has been a member of the church for 40, 50 years. It's the same Word. And every time it is championed, it comes forth, the victor, not the person, but the message. And our job is, and that's what we try to do in this program, and all the speakers that have ever been on here have tried to do, is let God's Word be true, and us get out of the way of it. So often today you, let me just ask you this, when you go to a worship service where you go to church, do you hear a lot of jokes? Do you hear a lot of pandering to you? Do you have music that comes on that tries to set you into a particular mood? Either a mood of somberness or a mood of great exuberance? Are you being manipulated when you go to worship? Or are you being taught the Word of God and the Word of God is touching your heart and causing you to change what you're doing? That's, you see, that's God's arrangement. Center it around the Word of God, not around emotionalism, not around that alone. Now, there's emotion involved in God's Word, no doubt about it, and in our service to the Lord, but not only emotional. There's reason in God's Word, and you can look at it, and you can understand it, and you can put it to practice in your lives. As we go on, receive the people at, at uh, Thessalonica received the Word of God as God's Word. They didn't receive it as it was maybe a suggestion or an option or a multiple choice. They received it as it was the Word of God. That's it also in chapter 2 and verse 13. Now to the church at Thessalonica, Paul addresses in, in every chapter of the first letter and into the second letter, he talks about the second coming of Christ. And he talks about how they should be ready for it. Friends, let me ask you this. If you lived every day as if judgment was coming that day, how would your life be better? One day, it'll all be over. Time will cease. And in the moment that it does, we will stand before God and give account for the deeds we have done in the flesh, whether good or evil. Are you ready for the judgment day? It's an old song we sing, are you ready? If you knew you would die in an hour, what would you do differently? Might you call that person 
and mend the fence that you need to mend? Might you do everything you could to try to convert everybody you could? Might you make sure that you're living right? Might you pray and study fervently? You see, if you knew that judgment was coming in an hour, you might do that, and you most likely would do that. So let, let's be sure that we understand judgment could come in an hour. It could come in a minute or a second. We don't know, just like you don't know when you're going to die. You don't know how much time you have. All you have is right now. And so we should live every moment of every day as if we will be called into judgment the next day. Someone says, well, that would be an uncomfortable way to live. No, it would not. It would be a very comfortable way to live because that's a life where there's no guilt. Isn't that a great life? Where there's forgiveness, where there's hope, you see. So why not live that life all the time? See the point? Well, these people are caught, talked about as being chosen by God. In chapter 1, verse 4, and in 2 Thessalonians 2, and verse 13 through 15, it says they were chosen by God. And how were they chosen by God? They heard, they believed, and they obeyed the gospel. That's how they were chosen. They were chosen of God. You're a, if you're a Christian, you're chosen of God. You have heard the Word of God, you have believed it, and you have obeyed what the Lord has told you to do. Well, they followed the apostles and the teachings of the apostles because the apostles got it from the Holy Spirit who Jesus had sent to comfort them. And notice what is said about them in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3 and verse 6 and verse 9. He says, you're a wonderful church. I know you for your work of faith, for your labor of love, and for the change that you have undergone. You have turned from your idols, and you're faithful to the Lord. You're laboring out of love and service to the Lord. You're not laboring as a party spirit, looking for what, who can get the most out of what. You don't, don't have your political parties in the body of Christ here at Thessalonica. You're trying to serve God, and you are evangelistic. Timothy comes back and tells Paul, this is an evangelistic group. They want to send the gospel everywhere they can. They want to teach it here. They want to teach it there. They're, they're ready to teach the gospel everywhere. And that's what we should be, doing everything we can to promote the preaching and teaching of the gospel of Christ wherever it might be. In 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 10, it says that they helped spread the gospel. They were evangelistic. And also, in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, they imitated the churches that were in Judea. Where did they learn to do this? They followed the example of their brethren in other areas. And they did these things because they were commanded to in the Word of God, but also because they saw it implemented by other Christians. And they knew that if you're a Christian, you must be an evangelist. You must be a person that is doing everything you can to preach and, and teach the Word of God wherever you may go. Well, from Thessalonica, because they had to leave pretty suddenly, Paul and Silas uh, were sent away by night in chapter 17 of Acts and verse 10. They were sent away by night. And they ended up at a place called Berea. And at Berea, there were some Jews there too because they went into the synagogue when they arrived at Berea. Well, the people at Berea were more noble-minded than the crowd they found at Thessalonica. Now we find that they later on were a wonderful church, but the beginning point of the church at Thessalonica was very violent to start with. Paul and Silas had to leave by night. They were being so challenged, and Jason, remember? Jason had such a problem, and others did too. But these were more noble than those of Thessalonica in their character and their honest seeking what was true. They were noble in character. Chapter 17 and verse 11. Now what does it mean to be noble in character? That means you have integrity. And that you just don't accept something because 
somebody comes in and impresses you. You listen to the words, you examine them to see if what's being said is true. They were more noble than Thessalonica because they searched the Scriptures daily to see if what was being said was true. Now friend, tonight if you're watching the program, we want to challenge you to do that once again. We've been asking you to do this for many, many years now. Examine your religious practices. You may have never done that, but don't you think it's time to see if you're doing what's right? Somebody says, oh no, I don't want to examine it. I know it's right. How do you know? How do you know that what you are doing religiously is correct? Where is the Bible passage that endorses, for instance, instrumental music, that endorses the idea that a person can be saved by saying a sinner's prayer, the idea that someone can be saved by faith only, the idea that a person is that the direct operation of the Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit baptism is still occurring today. Where is that in the Bible? Where is it in the Bible where you can read that it's okay for churches to organize schools and to organize all types of different programs? Where do you find in the Bible that it's all right to have a band come in and entertain the, the, the people at church? Or that you can eat in your buildings? Where is that in the Bible? Have you ever bothered to check that out? I ask you to do that. Be like the Bereans. They were noble. If they were wrong, they wanted to see if they were wrong. If they were right, they wanted to prove they were right. And let's do Bible things in Bible ways. Folks, remember what we said. In the history of this country, we see that there was a great revival that was held where over 30,000 different denominational people came together at Cane Ridge, Kentucky. And there was preaching done for many, many days. And the preaching that was done was this way. Let's do away with all our denominational names, all our denominational creed books, and let's go back to the Bible and follow the Bible and only the Bible. In our every, and let's have authority for all that we do. Let's speak where the Bible speaks. And let's be silent where it's silent. That was the admonition, and we give you that admonition tonight. Continue to search and be like the Bereans to see if what you are doing is authorized by God. You don't have anything to fear because if you aren't doing right, guess what? You'll learn it and you'll change. And if you're doing right, continue. Now notice in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, we see there that these people there were just like in Acts 17, 11, that they were just like the people of Acts 2, 41. They received the Word with all readiness. They weren't gullible. These weren't ignorant people. These were people seeking the truth. And when they heard the truth, they knew it was truth because they could prove it was. Not because it just dawned on them, but because it was there. You see, God's plan of salvation had been going on and has been going on now for how many thousands of years? And the way that we are saved today is the same way they were saved back then, by doing the things of God. They searched the Scriptures daily. Oh, that we could get people to do that. Oh, that we would do that for all that we do. That we would search the Scriptures daily to see and check out if what we are doing and how we are approaching God and how we are serving Him in the churches, if we could see if there's authority for what we're doing. In John 5, verse 39, and 2 Timothy chapter 3, 15 through 17, we see that all Scripture is inspired of God that it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God might be perfect and truly furnished unto every good work. Now, what does that mean? That God's Word's sufficient, folks. It's a sufficient for what we need. We don't need anything else. We can find out what God wants us to do by going to His book and reading His instructions. 
But just like people that try to put together a child's toy, there are always people that say, I don't need the instructions. I don't care what the instructions say. I'm just going to do this on my own. Most likely they will meet with disaster in that because they are operating without a pattern of sound words. In Acts 17, read with me in verse 11 and 12. Acts 17, verse 11 and 12, and we have it up here for you if you don't have time to get to it. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They studied, folks. Therefore, many of them believed. And notice who some of them were. Not just a few of the Greeks and some prominent women, as well as men. So you find some pretty prominent people in town that have turned from their idolatry. Now these prominent people, these women in town, would have been those who would have been spouses of men who were idolaters, who would have been involved in idolatry themselves. The Greeks, not a few of them, that means a lot of them. The Greeks, as well as men that were prominent, turned to the Lord. Now friend, think about someone who has been an idolater. Think about someone who has been involved and in, doesn't even know much about God. They've been involved in, let's say today in the modern world, involved in Buddhism and Islam and all of these types of different religious beliefs. And you take God's Word and you read it to them and you study it and you preach to them and you talk with them and they, they change. Is the Word of God powerful enough to do that? Yep, sure is. You know the name of this program is The Word and Sword. You know why? Because the Word of God is likened to a sword. In Hebrews chapter 4, it, it cuts to the dividing of, of bone and marrow. It's the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It cuts you. It pricks your heart if you let it have its, let it have its way with you. They heard the same gospel in Acts 17, verses 10 through 15 in Berea, that people heard in Jerusalem and Samaria and Caesarea and Philippi and Thessalonica. They heard the same gospel, folks. They didn't hear some new message. It was the same thing. And they received the same gospel and believed the same gospel that all these others did. So wouldn't it be reasonable if they received the same gospel, believed the same gospel, heard the same gospel, responded to the same gospel, wouldn't it be logical and certain to conclude that these people repented, were baptized just as other people were in Acts 2 and verse 41, Acts 8, Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 10, 47, Acts 16, and so on. Wouldn't it be reasonable to, to again, someone says, well now preacher, you're stretching it. Well, let's look and see whether we're stretching it. Somebody says, it doesn't say all these people were baptized. And you know what? You're right, it doesn't. But does it have to? When a person acts by faith, what does faith move someone to do? Faith moves you to obey, doesn't it? Love moves you to obey. Someone says, well, now wait just a minute. You don't have baptism in these passages. Well, let's, let's try that out. Try that reasoning out. Let's work together here for just a moment. Now, look at all the examples of conversion in the book of Acts. And do you know that with the exception of the household of Cornelius, that all the Acts are not mentioned in each case? Does that mean that faith is not important? Because faith isn't mentioned in every type of situation in the conversions. It's implied. It's certainly necessarily implied, but it's not mentioned. So were these people, was that group of people saved without faith? You would say no, and I would too. But it doesn't say that faith was involved. But do we assume by their actions that they heard the Word of God, they believed it? They had faith that what it was being said was true. 
Why would they go on and be baptized? Because all of them were baptized. Why would they be baptized if they didn't have any faith? You see, Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You don't get baptized for the remission of your sins unless you believe something about Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Because in the book of, in the book of Acts chapter 8, with the story of the eunuch, we see that the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ was preached to him, and he concluded by what was said that he needed to be baptized in water. Does it say that Philip talked to him about baptism? No. But did he? Yeah. Because the man knew about it, didn't he? Whatever was done in the preaching of Christ this man knew that he needed to be baptized. And Philip said, if you believe, you can. So we see there, Philip wasn't going to baptize him if he didn't have faith. Now, would Paul baptize people if they didn't have faith? No. Would Paul baptize people if they didn't confess Christ was the Son of God? No. Nope. Would Silas? Did Silas have some, uh, some special instruction from the Lord? No. Barnabas? John Mark? No. So when they obeyed Christ, when they were moved, when they heard, when they received the gospel, by implication they were believing the gospel, and by implication if they believed it, they were obedient to it. And how were they obedient to it? We look back at the other examples of salvation and how people were saved, and we see that they were all, without exception, baptized for the remission of their sins. Well, let's go on in our travels. We've been to Thessalonica. We've been to Berea now. And now, let's go to Athens. Athens, Greece. Again, a large city. A city that is well known. And a lot of, lot of society people are there. A lot of uh, philosophers from everywhere are there. And a lot of idolatry is there. Again, who would think that Athens would have anything to do with who could get somebody to be a Christian in Athens? We might bypass this city. No, no. Athens was a celebrated city, folks. It was the capital of Attica and the leading Grecian Republic and the seat of the Greek literature in the golden period of Greece. The inhabitants had a reputation of being really enamored by novelty. In Acts 17, verse 21, as Paul is waiting for, Paul, for Silas to, and Timothy to come, he's waiting there, and he has a tremendous zeal. And this is the type of zeal, folks, all of us should have. In the book of uh, Acts 17, look at verse 21. They had a remarkably zealous attitude about worshiping the gods. In Acts 17, 16, you're very religious, Paul says to them. So the city was full of temples. It was full of altars and other sacred places. And Paul visits Athens on his second missionary journey from Berea in Acts 17, 14. And he's delivered in the Areopagus, a very famous speech. This is the Mars Hill speech, where he says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. And I, as I was passing by, I saw you worshiping all these gods. And I noted that you had a place there in a little area where you had erected a remembrance of an unknown god, just in case you might have missed one. It is him I wish to declare to you, for he is the one that is unknown to you. The city was wholly given over to idols, and Paul in Acts 17, 16, as he stood there, his, it says his spirit was moved or provoked within him. He was stirred. When he saw people doing evil, it bothered him. Now, friend, let me ask you this tonight. And this is a question I need to ask myself. When you or I see people doing evil, does it sufficiently bother us to do something about it? To tell the person that they're doing evil? Someone says, well, you might make them mad. 
Yeah, and you might, it might be the very thing they need to hear. You might get hurt if you told somebody that they were worshiping wrong. Well, that's exactly what Paul told these people. You're very religious, but you are religiously in error. You're wrong. Now, that's the impact of his words. Somebody says he didn't say it that way. You read the text. Yes, he did. You're very religious, but you're worshiping the wrong God. Now, what's, how does that interpret? That's pretty bold, isn't it? You're worshiping every God in the world except the right one. Yeah, sound a little bit familiar? Sound like Jesus? It does, doesn't it? I love you. I care about you. You're very religious, Pharisees and Jews, but you're like painted tombstones. Again, bold preaching, firm preaching from God's Word. That, as my grandmother says, and used to, well, she's been dead and gone now, but she used to say, son, gospel preaching is putting the salve on the sore. Well, you know that's true. You know, a lot of people don't know what salve is now. That's medicine. And you put it on the place where it's needed. If your foot's hurting, you don't put the medicine to take care of it on your ear. You put it where the problem is, don't you? Well, these people were worshiping a God, gods that they, they had invented themselves. And they were worshiping all of them. They were covering all the ground. They were full of novelty. They, they wanted to hear some new thing, they said. Some of them spent their whole day trying to hear something new. Some of them were fascinated with what Paul said, not because they were interested in obeying it, but because it was just a new idea. And sometimes sowing the seed is going to find that type of audience too, that type of soil. They're just curious. But what is the end result? The seed is sown, isn't it? The seed sown even in their hearts. So Paul goes and reasons with those in the synagogues both Jews and Gentile worshipers there. Because in Athens, the Gentiles were allowed to be in there. And then he reasoned daily in the marketplaces with those who were there in Acts 17 and verse 17. He was encountering Stoics and Epicurean philosophers. And I want you to notice that Paul stood toe to toe with them. Did he know about the Epicurean philosophy and the Stoic philosophy? Yes, because Paul was not only a Jew, he was a Roman. He knew of the Roman philosophies. He knew about them. He was taught by Gamaliel, a noted, famous teacher of the Jews. The Jews knew the laws of Rome. So Paul knew their doctrine. He knew their erroneous doctrines. These philosophers that presented themselves to others as the elite intellectuals Paul stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. And he goes on Mars Hill so they could hear this new doctrine of Jesus Christ and the resurrection in Acts 17, verses 18 through 21. And he begins to talk to them about this. <clears throat> and many of them are absolutely astounded <clears throat> and said they would hear more. And then others walked away but there were those who obeyed. So you have the obedient, some who want to study more, and then you have some who walk away. Is that not what we're going to have today? Sometimes we may have more walk away than obey. Sometimes we may have more walk away than want to study more. But what's the end result? The gospel has been preached. People have heard the truth. And that's what we should be doing, isn't it? People lament the idea that the church isn't growing. And I've heard even brethren today say, oh, the, the, the face of local churches has turned, the, the heads have turned gray. Well, did you know that for the first time in history that there are more gray-headed people than there are teenagers? There's 35 million gray-headed people, 60 and over, and there's 25 million teenagers. First time in history that's ever been the case. 
So what does that tell us? That tells us that we're a whole, we're, this society is full of gray-headed people that should know and should have a desire to know more about the Word of God. But is that the case, friends? No. What we do is we sit back and we say, oh no, we can't win. The world is done. The Muslim religion is the fastest religion in the world. We can't do anything about it. Oh my, they're going to overrun us. Instead of taking the Word of God to them and teaching them. Somebody says you might get killed. You might. But what a way to die, friend. Preaching the Word of God. Did Paul get killed? He did. Why? For preaching the gospel. Is there enough evidence that you're a Christian to convict you in a court of law? It's a good question to ask for all of us. What does my life show that's different from the average person? How committed am I to the gospel of Christ? And how committed are you to the gospel of Jesus Christ? In Acts 17, verses 18 through 21, Paul encounters the Epicureans. You know what the Epicureans believed? That pleasure was the highest end of love. It was patriotic to be full of pleasure. It was a kind and generous act to be devoted to eating, to drinking, and being merry because tomorrow you die. Living for the moment. That was the Epicurean philosophy very similar to the Australian philosophy throughout their country that says no worries. Just live for today, that's it. Don't worry about tomorrow and just get everything you can out of today and live it with all the zest you can. Now is there a principle there that is biblical? Yes. You see every bit of error has some truth mixed in it. Is it not the Ecclesiastes writer that told us that what is good for a man to do all the days of his life, but to eat and to drink and to enjoy the fruit of his labor? Yes, he says that. That's from God. But notice the Epicureans took it out, did not follow that. They did not note that all we do, Ecclesiastes 12, that every act we commit, we will be judged for. So there is a checks and balance system put on this idea of enjoying life. Yes, enjoy life, but know this, that you will give account for every deed you do in the flesh. So be careful how you walk. Be careful how you talk. Be careful where you go and what you say. Watch out. But do enjoy your life while you're on this earth. But the best way to enjoy this life is to be a Christian. Not to give yourself over to excesses and be selfish. That was the Epicurean philosophy. And it was nowhere near the wise man's philosophy of Ecclesiastes. These people went on, the Epicureans, because they did not want to think of the consequences of this type of lifestyle. They denied that the world was created. They perhaps were the first evolutionists. They, they declared that matter was eternal. That was Epicurean. Do we have any Epicureans around today? Yes, we do. We sure do. They denied that there was any future accountability for anything that you do. And so you can see why Paul's teaching about Jesus Christ would rattle these people. They denied the immortality of the soul, in other words, that the soul would live on. And they denied the gods exercised any providential control over anything. Their own gods. Not God, but their own gods. In other words, they were in charge of their own destiny. They were the followers of a man named Epicurus, who acknowledged no gods except in name only. They are figments of our imaginations created for our own inadequacies. That was Epicurus. He denied that the gods of the, that were invented by man exercised any government over the world or its inhabitants, and that the chief good consisted in the gratification of yourself. 
Now, does that sound like people today? It does, doesn't it? Opposite to the Epicureans, for the most part, some similarities, were the Stoics. And they believed that the world was created by Zeus. All things were governed by the fates to whom Zeus himself was subject. So Zeus was subject to chance. He could be hurt, he could be damaged, he could be destroyed. Self-denial was thought to contribute to the highest end of life. So what the Stoic said is that you must be so self-controlled that you do not enjoy any pleasure. Affections were to be suppressed, they were non-emotional. Apathy, they preferred that over pleasure or pain. They were just without feeling. They had mastery, they said that you were what you should be in this life by mastering all your desires and lusts. In other words, that you're a control freak and you have everything under control. They also, however, like the Epicureans, denied the immortality of the soul. Now, Zeno was the founder of the Stoics, and he was born in Cyprus about 30 years before Christ, so his disciples were called Stoics, and there is a very strong possibility that Zeno himself was still around when Paul was preaching. But Paul, in preaching on Mars Hill, in his sermon, says, I, he perceived the Athenians were very religious. Idols that represented their gods lined the city road, where Paul referred to as the, he referred to all those as objects of worship, in verse 23. And among all these objects of worship, intermingled with them, was an idol labeled to the unknown God, verse 23. And Paul says in verse 23 and 24, Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. And here's the things he told them about God that overwhelmed many of them. I want to talk to you about this unknown God you have, he would say, who made the world and everything that's in it. Now that flew in the face of the Stoics and the Epicureans, didn't it? that He made the world and everything in it. And notice the next point in verse 24, that He is sustainer of it. He is the Lord of heaven and of earth. There's not a God of the heavens and a God of the earth. There's not a God of the underworld and a God of the heavens. There's not a God of uh, the goats and a God of the people. There's not a God of the wind. There's not a God of the speed. There's not a God of love. There's one God. He is the sustainer and the creator of everything. Everything. Well, just stop right there, Paul. That's a God we haven't heard of. Because all of our gods, not a one of them is creator and sustainer. We're just limited by the fates. We're, everything is by chance. There is no providence of our gods. There's no sustaining power that He has. Verse 24, this God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Wow, isn't that something? Picture where Paul is. Lined all up and down the city of Athens are temples made with hands to the goddess Athena, to the goddess Diana, to the god Zeus, to the god Jupiter, Hermes, Ares, and so on. All of these are the gods of men, and they literally do dwell. If that, that's because the only greatness they have is the temple that was built to them. They dwell in temples made with hands, but God does not. And in verse 25, he says, and he, he, the God of the, that you, the unknown God, he's not worshiped with men's hands. He's worshiped with their hearts. People are devoted to him, and he's not worshiped with men's hands. 
This God, this unknown God, furthermore, Paul goes on to say in verse 24, that he created or made from one blood every nation of men. And what that said was there's no Jew Gentile. There's no class system. There's no, uh, we are all related to Adam. All of us have something in common, and that is that we are human. We are not God-man. We are not man-God. We are not some invention that took, took several years to take place. God made from one blood every nation of men. So all nations belong to this God. He is the sovereign of everything. He is sustainer, He is creator, and He is sovereign of all things. In verse 26, He has determined the times and the boundaries of man. He knows man. And it is not just left up to fate as to what happens to man. God has a plan to save mankind. And He has determined, He is a Savior. He's a sovereign, He's a savior, He's a creator, He's a sustainer. And then verse 27 he says, and also I want to tell you something. This God I've just talked to you about, He's not far from every one of us. He's not so far you can't find Him. He doesn't hide from man. He is there. And if you seek Him, you can find Him. He's not far from every one of us. That means he's not, a, he's not a preferer of men. He's not doesn't play favorites. In verse 20, 28, it is in him that we find meaning to life. In him we live, we move, and we owe our very existence to him. We live and move and have our very being because of this one. Now notice he's not just talking about God the Father. He's talking about Jesus. He's preaching Jesus, folks. He's preaching the Holy Spirit. He's preaching the Godhead. Creator, sustainer, sovereign, revelator, sustainer of the world, always available, not far from any one of us, accessible. And He is the one that gives us any type of meaning with our lives. Do you know the first century world and the idolatry, idolatrous world of the Greek, Greco-Roman concept of God was a lonesome, dissatisfied world? full of sin, full of guilt, full of disease, full of filth. And notice, they didn't have any meaning to their life. The fates were determining their life. They would go and consult the person up there on the hill that took drugs, and they would see whether they would go to battle or not. But not this God. It is in Him we live and we move and we have our very being. Friends, do you know a God like that? Do you know the Savior? Do you know the Sustainer, the Creator, the Sovereign? Do you know Him? In verse 29, notice Paul goes on to talk about the divine nature of God, that He is Spirit, and He is Creator, and He is eternal. He was not created. You cannot mark in history when He first came out. He was not the son or the grandson or the great-grandson of some inferior God before Him. He was not the result of some mixing of God-man. He wasn't. He was eternal and is eternal. He is spirit. He is creator. He is not created. He's eternal. 
Now that concept again would have rattled the mind of the, God, the, the idol worshiper of that day. For their gods were not eternal. Somewhere in time they existed. But before time there was no explanation for what happened then. Well, the one to whom you worship without knowing, he's the one I proclaim to you. Do you have the nerve to say that to somebody that's a Buddhist or a, a Shinto philosophy or someone who's Islamic? It is the one to whom you worship without knowing. He's the one I proclaim to you. What was the result of all this? Look at verse 32 of Acts 17. Some mocked the idea. Some mocked the idea of the resurrection. And some procrastinated. You can go back to the charts now. And said, we want to hear you again. You can come to the charts, please. Some said, we're going to hear you again. They put off. And some joined Paul, and they believed him. Dionysius, an Areopagite member. Now that was a major, major win right there, the gospel touching this man. But Dionysius, a council member, and a woman named Damaris, and others, it says, joined Paul and believed. Now what does belief come to? Remember the eunuch? If you believe, you can. So he confessed, and what happened? He was baptized. Bible belief, friends, faith itself, John tells us, Jesus told us, that it is in and of itself a work. Well, some in Thessalonica were persuaded by the evidence, received the Word, believed, and were sanctified by the Spirit. And then we see that in Berea they heard with readiness, they searched it out and received the gospel as the truth by obeying it. And then we see also as we go on through here that there were some in Athens that were willing to receive the Word of God and repent and join the disciples, become part of them. Now that's a major deal, isn't it? They turned. So they, Acts 16.31, so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. Acts 16, 31. And what are the applications to all we've studied? That no one can be saved and turn to God without hearing the gospel. You start where the people are. You teach them the things they need to hear. Friends, we all must be truth seekers. And we're all saved the same way. All of these people were saved the same way. They heard the gospel, they believed it, they repented, they confessed, and they were baptized. And that did not undo grace. It did not undo the love of God. It did not minimize either one of those. Again, going back to our illustration that we made a couple of weeks ago, we're not spinning the wheel of salvation and just picking one and leaving the others alone. True faith, friends, moves you to obedience. The gospel is for all, and we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive in the, for the works we have done in the flesh. Where do we find out how to act? In the Bible. So we have to ask, have you been converted like the people of the New Testament were? Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God if you confessed it? Have you by faith obeyed the truth in repentance and baptism? And again, were you saved after you were baptized or before? Friends, you can prepare for judgment tonight if you will. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 20. Read with me if you will. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verses 13 through 20. For this reason, you come to the charts. <clears throat> please come to the charts, please. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, 
but as it is in truth the Word of God that also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God that are in Judea and Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. Did it cost them something to be Christians? It certainly did, and it'll cost you too. It costs you every day. But it doesn't matter how much it costs here, because it's well worth it, isn't it? They killed both the Lord Jesus Christ, they killed their own prophets, and they persecuted us, and they don't please God, and they're contrary to all men. They forbid us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as always, to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost." So friends, what we're seeing there is that it costs Paul and Silas and others, and it costs New Testament Christians to merely be Christians. We have it so easy, relatively speaking, than they did in the first century. He goes on to say, We, brethren, haven't been taken away from you for a short time in presence, are eager to see you. We desire strongly to. I, for what is our hope and our joy or our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? Paul wanted these people to go to heaven. Every good Christian, every gospel preacher who preaches to crowds had better have as his motive, I want this crowd that I'm preaching to, every one of them to go to heaven. You are our glory, and you are our joy." Paul felt that way about the people he preached to, and every gospel preacher who's worth his salt will feel the same way about the people he preaches to. You're our glory, and you're our joy. You're what makes life worth it. Someone says, well, now wait a minute. Sometimes people don't act that way, okay? But still, these people were acting that way. And Paul says, you're our glory and our joy. Isn't that a great attitude to have? Isn't that how it should be? We want you to know that on the first and third Tuesdays of every month, this program comes to you at 8 p.m. We study God's Word on this program because it's beautiful. And we're not ashamed of it. Now, we've been to Thessalonica, we've been to Berea, we've been to Athens, and now let's go to Corinth. Oh my, what a city. Goodness. This is going to be in Acts 18, verses 1 through 18. These people were going to be converted too, just like the prodigal son came back where he was. He was converted, he changed, and he was in his father's household, but he came where he needed to. He was tra changed. Conversion means changed. The Athenians were changed. The Thessalonians were changed. The people of Berea were changed. And they didn't just change in their actions. They didn't just change in their knowledge. They didn't just change in their conviction or their allegiance. They changed in all those. They changed in their thinking, they changed in their will, they changed in their commitment. And that resulted in a relationship, an identity change. They were totally, totally changed. A change in who we are, change in how we talk, where we go, what we do, that is true conversion, friends. It's not recycling and carrying in the old sinful ideas we have bringing them in and trying to justify them. It's turning your back on them. That's what it is. Now remember the law of the Lord's perfect, converting the soul. The Word of God is able to do that. So we're going throughout the known world at this time, and now we come to a place called Corinth, located on an isthmus that is four miles wide between the Aegean and the Adriatic Sea. It's 50 miles west-southwest of Athens, Greece. It's the Roman capital of Achaia, which is the largest city in Greece at the time. Corinth is. And it's the center of trade and commerce. It was at the foot of a place called the Acre Corinth, which was an Acropolis that rose 1,800 feet. Somebody says, wow, that's, 
That's, a, that's, that's on a mountain. Yes, it is. I've been there. That's where it was located, but it was also very close to the sea. So remember how we're telling you the topography of the land was different? I don't know how you are, but sometimes when we study the Bible, we think everybody lived in the desert and rode camels. Well, guess what? They didn't. Most of them were coastal. They rode a lot of, they got, got around in a bunch of boats. And they traveled with donkeys. They traveled just like we do. They traveled, they had caravansias, which were nothing in the world but hope motels along the routes that were there. They had big caravansias for big tra uh, merchant uh, groups with lots of wagons where they could stop and they could uh, make sure their wagons were all uh, maintained and their horses were watered and that type of thing. And they had the small ones for the poor people or for the person that's just traveling for a short distance. They didn't have to sleep out under a tree. They had places they could go. These were fortified places. Again, these were people that had a lot of sense. They had a lot of ability. They were not ignorant people. And also, these places were real places. The city of Corinth, the ancient city of Corinth, before it was destroyed later on, uh, included a wealthy temple there to the worship of Aphrodite. And it was served by a thousand prostitutes. By the time of Paul, this had come out and, and had gotten to the point where it was in disarray and most of the prostitutes had come off the mountains and the temples and were wandering around the cities and around the city of Corinth. Apollo and Poseidon and Aphrodite were the main gods that were worshipped, but there were many pagan temples at, at Corinth. Corinth, even the ancient Corinth, had a reputation as a very wicked city. Immorality was rampant, and to call a young lady a Corinthian maiden was to call her a prostitute. It was a very horrible place. The name Corinthian became known as a very decadent place. To Corinthiazo is the name, to act like a Corinthian came to mean to commit fornication. And when a Corinthian was represented in the plays and the, uh, the, that were given in the arenas, they were always drunk and carousing with the women. It was the Vanity Fair at Corinth of the Roman world. It was into the midst of the mongrel, mongrel population of Greek adventurers and Romans with an infusion of sailors and ex-soldiers and philosophers and merchants and freedmen and slaves and tradespeople, every type of shyster you could find, and agents for every vice. This is described by the historians of the day. This was Corinth, where Greeks and Latins and Syrians and Asians and Egyptians and Jews bought and sold. They labored, they reveled, they quarreled, they hobnobbed, and in its cities and its ports, and there was nowhere else like Corinth in all of Greece. Corinthian leather came from there. Corinthian steel later on came from that area. So they did have some things that were beneficial, but it was mainly noted for its vices. Some have called it the Las Vegas of the ancient world. Well, it is in this area that the Lord sent Paul and told him that there are many people in this city. I have many people there. You stay there and you preach. And he did for a year and a half. Among those that he met, whether they were converts when he met them or whether he was involved in their conversion, there were two, there was a couple. They made tents like Paul did. Their names were Aquila, who was a Jew originally from Pontus, and he was from around the Black Sea, south of the Black Sea, and Priscilla, his wife. And they had come from Rome, Italy, because of the edict in 49 AD from Claudius for all the Jews to leave Rome. He didn't want to mess with the Jews, and so he said, all of you get out. So they did, and they came and settled in Corinth. Paul stayed with them because they were tent makers in chapter 18 and verse 3. 
And again, they came, became Christians at some point because they were very beneficial to Apollos later on. Paul, as his custom was, began his work of evangelism in the synagogues. And that's in 18, chapter 18 of Acts and verses 4 through 6. And when Timothy and Silas arrived from Macedonia, Paul was able to devote more time to preaching and didn't give as much time to tent making as he had. But he preached, and he kept on preaching, and he kept on preaching. In Acts 18 and verse 5, when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the Word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Again, Paul walked right into the middle of the Jews and said, guess what? Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the one you've been waiting for. And they didn't know one of them believe it when he told them the first time. Well, you think about that. How much nerve does it take to do that? Does it take nerve, friends, or does it take faith? And maybe our problem is not a problem with nerve. Some of us are pretty nervy. Our problem was with faith. Do we believe this Word will change people? We are so concerned about what might, how it might be, might be received or perceived that we don't say anything sometimes. Paul, on the other hand, and the evangelist of the New Testament, were people that didn't really care how it was received. They wanted people to receive it well, but they were more interested in, are they telling it? Are they sowing the seed of the Word of God? Friends, this program has been going on for over 30 years on this network, on this, in this station. And someone says, well, have you had tons of people that have obeyed? We've had a number of people that have obeyed the gospel over the years after hearing the Word of God preached here. But you know what? We've had a whole lot of people that haven't. But you know what? We're not all about who we baptized. We're all about sowing the seed of the Word of God by this venue. It's a very fortunate venue. It's something to be cherished. It's a great tool that we have that we can preach the gospel in so many areas, so many locations, to so many people all at one time. This is a thrill for me to be able to teach the gospel and to know that it may has the potential to get out to as many people as it does. That's what we all should be doing. How many of us have a website, a computer, that we can get the gospel across the world if we'll just spend time teaching it and quit telling people that we ate a, we ate a cookie for lunch or that we baked a cake. I'm sure somebody somewhere is very interested in that, but I'm not because that doesn't do a thing for my soul. Facebook is so full of trash and minutia, but it can be used so well for the gospel, can it? So don't you tell me you can't preach the gospel. Don't tell me you can't sow the seed. Yes, you can. You just have to have the faith to do it and to believe that it will do something. God said His Word will not return to Him void, but it will do what He, what he said it to do. In Acts 18, when they opposed Him and blasphemed, He shook His garments and said to them, Your blood be on your heads, I'm clean. I'll just go to the Gentiles. So He did, there at Corinth. So He left the synagogue and He began teaching in the house of Titius Justice, probably a Gentile who is called a worshiper of God. Crispus, who is the ruler of the synagogue with all of his house, along with many other Corinthians, heard, believed, and were baptized. Chapter 18 and verse 8. So they heard, they believed, and they were baptized. Sound familiar? Very familiar, doesn't it? So 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17, what does it say? Some of those there said, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. They were following preachers. He said, I want to tell you something, don't follow me. Follow the Lord. Paul didn't die for him, he said. Paul didn't baptize in his own name. They were baptized in the name of Christ. Jesus died for them, he says. They couldn't be of Paul. They belonged to Christ. So that's tantamount to what we have today in denominations. What are you when you're baptized into Christ for remission of your sins? You're a Christian. You're not a Baptist. You're not a Methodist. You're not Episcopalian. You're a Christian. 
That's it, Acts 11, 26. So there's two things essential to be of Christ, to die to sin, to be buried in water, and to be cut, raised to walk in newness of life, baptized by His authority. So you and I are converted the same way that they were back then. It's important for all of us to obey what Christ said we're to do. Don't be discouraged, friends, by the lack of results or rejections. For Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 7, if we preach the gospel and plant the seed, that God gives the increase. I planted, Apollos watered, but it is God who gives the increase. Isaiah 55, 11. What may appear to be hard soil, another lesson we learned tonight. Look at all these cities. Places that you would think nobody would give you the time of day about Jesus. That's where root was found. That's where good soil was found for the truth. People hurting people are the ones we need to be reaching, aren't they? How many people do we walk by that are hurting? How about giving a tract to that homeless guy that's there begging? How about doing that? Silver and gold have I none, mister, but I have something better for you. I have the gospel of Christ. I've got a Bible. I'll give you that. You know, read it. What may appear to be hard soil and something that no one... Let's just go to Paul. Would you bother to teach Paul? I wouldn't. And I'm ashamed of that. Paul preaches at Corinth for a year and six months. The Jews bring accusations against Paul to Gallio. He wants the Jews to deal with all the matters themselves. Sothenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, is beaten before the judgment seat there at Corinth, and the gospel stops, doesn't it? Oh, no, it doesn't. The gospel doesn't stop, friends. It just keeps going. And it's victorious. And it is every time it's told. Every time. Every time the gospel is preached, there's a victory. The seed has been sown once more. You've been very kind to be with us tonight. Been, we appreciate so much, and we hope that you follow along in the book of Acts as we've been traveling tonight. Are you tired? I sort of am. We've gone a long way. Gone all the way from Thessalonica to Corinth. That's a long journey. But you think about how far Paul traveled, over 2,000 miles in all his preaching. Now you and I have work to do, don't we? We need to be teaching the gospel, sowing the seed, listening to it ourselves, and obeying it. Friends, nothing better you could do than sow the seed of the kingdom of the Word of God, and you just have the faith to believe that it will accomplish what God set it out to do. It's not all about you. It's all about the Word. Preach it. Teach it. Obey it. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight, and we bid you a good week.